Politics lead money desperately needed to resist Russian invaders in Ukraine or hunt down Hamas terrorists or shore up Taiwan's democracy. All of it, billions of dollars of worth, it, worth of it, hangs precariously between bipartisan support in the U.S. Senate and Republican intransigent and divisions in the U.S. House. In the early morning hours today, nearly half of Senate Republicans joined Democrats in passing $95 billion in foreign aid. But... House Speaker Mike Johnson greeted the breakthrough in the months-long debate with a shrug. His stated reason, the bill fails to address security at the U.S. border, which is true. But this is after he killed a border deal that the conservative Border Patrol Union supported, which had been part of the Senate deal, but then was removed. Joining me now is Democratic Senator Chris Coons of Delaware. Senator, if House Speaker um, Johnson won't bring this bill to a vote when tied to a border deal or without being tied to a border deal, how do you get this passed in the House? Well, Jake, that's a great question. As you said in your uh, introduction there, very early this morning, by a strong bipartisan vote of 70 to 29, the Senate sent to the House uh, a $95 billion national security supplemental. There's a few different ways it could come through the House and get to the president's desk. I am hopeful that Speaker Mike Johnson will yet be persuaded that there is urgency. Ukraine is running out of ammunition and running out of time. And Speaker Johnson has said he supports Ukraine in its fight on the front lines of freedom against Russian aggression. The reason we don't have a border security provision, as you just indicated, was that former President Donald Trump turned on the bill, campaigned against it, and persuaded Republicans to defeat a bill that would have given President Biden both money and authorities he needs to secure our southern border. So if they have a better idea over in the House, they should send it to the Senate, but they should take up this security bill first and pass it. I want to get your take on uh, Donald Trump saying uh, that he had a conversation with the head of a NATO country when he was president, and they said, what are you going to do if we don't pay 2% of our uh, defense budget, uh, two percent of our budget on defense, and he said, I, "Well, I wouldn't protect." I'm paraphrasing here, but something along the lines of, "We wouldn't protect you. The U.S. wouldn't protect you, and I would tell the Russians to do whatever the hell they want." Uh, what was your response to that? This was a, a shocking thing for a former president and likely candidate of the Republican Party to be the next president to say, not just if he did actually have that conversation while he was president, but that he's bragging about it now. In the face of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, our European allies have upped their defense spending dramatically. I was recently in Poland with my Republican colleague, Mike Rounds. Poland is spending 4% of their GDP on defense. We recently welcomed Chancellor Schultz, uh, who visited with a dozen senators before he met with President Biden they have dramatically increased their defense spending and welcomed millions of refugees from Ukraine and helped lead the work in NATO and in Europe to arm and support Ukraine. For the president of the United States, former and possibly future, to say intentionally that he would willfully throw our NATO allies to the Russian wolves if they didn't pay up, suggests that NATO isn't a collective security treaty, but a protection racket where he's shaking down our allies for them to increase their defense investment. Um, I think this was beneath a president and a strong reason why he should not be reelected. Your Democratic colleague from Maryland, Chris Van Hollen, uh, took to the Senate floor and said this about Israel in its war against Hamas in Gaza. Take a listen. Kids in Gaza are now dying from the deliberate withholding of food. In addition to the horror of that news, one other thing is true. That is a war crime. It is a textbook war crime. And that makes those who orchestrate it war criminals. So he is saying that Israel is committing war crimes and that Benjamin Netanyahu and others are war criminals. Do you agree? 
Look, my friend and colleague, Senator Van Hollen, has been very passionately engaged in advocating for humanitarian relief to get into Gaza. Uh, and he recognizes that the intentional interference with the delivery of humanitarian relief, that the use of hunger as a weapon of war is a war crime. I agree with that. Uh, whether or not that means that Prime Minister Netanyahu um, should be accused of or in any way charged with a war crime, there is a gap between those two points. And it's important that we continue um, to fund humanitarian relief, that we in Congress and our president continue to press relentlessly uh, on the IDF and on Prime Minister Netanyahu to facilitate the delivery of humanitarian aid. Look, Jake, we are on the verge of a potential IDF assault on Rafa. Um, that would be a disaster. And I would urge Israeli leadership uh, with whom I've spoken recently um, to step back from this precipice and to not move ahead until there is a clear and credible plan uh, for conducting any further campaigns in Gaza without increasing civilian deaths. Do you see any disconnect between staying up all night to give Israel billions of dollars to conduct this war and what you just said? Well, I also stood up all night, uh, stayed up all night for the $10 billion in critically needed humanitarian aid that is a part of this package. Uh, every package of funding includes things uh, that we are excited about and supportive of, things that we can find our way to support, and things we have challenges with. I have long been a strong supporter of Israel, and I continue to believe that supporting Israel in their fight against Hamas, which carried out a horrific terrorist attack, the worst attack on Jews in the world since the Shoah, is something that is worth doing. But it stands in stark contrast to the humanitarian cost of this war. President Biden has consistently called on Prime Minister Netanyahu to change the conduct of their campaign against Hamas to one that reduces civilian deaths and consequences. And there have been significant steps in that direction taken by the administration. Mm -hmm. Jake, I hope and pray that the urgent negotiations to release hostages and achieve a ceasefire will succeed in coming days. That's the path I hope we are on. Senator Chris Coons of Delaware, thanks so much. Appreciate it, sir. Sheriff's Deputy.